Good Wednesday evening, everyone. Welcome to the Carolinas Weather Group. Uh, this is May the 13th, halfway through the month of May, and uh, we appreciate you guys coming on. It's been a busy uh, week weather-wise here in the Carolinas. We had a few severe thunderstorms roll through and uh, yesterday and Monday, so we might talk a little bit about that. But tonight we have on Tony Rice. He is the weather space weather guy. He knows everything about the uh, space and weather. And he's going to come on and talk to us and uh, educate me because I don't know much about it. So I'm looking forward to tonight and uh, looking forward to getting to uh, learn a little bit of stuff. Before we do that, I will uh, do a few housekeeping rules. This is a live uh, YouTube broadcast, so uh, we do have a question and an answer tab. If you have any questions for our guests tonight, please feel free to uh, ask them on that, and we'll get them into the show. You can also ask via Twitter and Facebook, Carolina Weather Group, on each of those, and we will make sure to uh, get those to Tony. Uh, you can also uh, download this podcast once we get it back up on the uh, App Store, and you can listen to it anytime. And... Uh, through your uh, local app store or whatever uh, whatever store you use to download those uh, those podcasts. So with that and me stuttering, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Joey Massa from Catawba County. Joey? Thank you. Thank you, Scotty. Yeah, weather-wise this week, um, there was really nothing in my area, so I don't care. But <laughs> that, was, uh, that was pretty much it. Yeah, and like, like Scotty said, uh, this show was kind of my idea. I said I want to do a space weather show, but... Uh, I, I honestly, I'm here to learn because a lot of guys in the weather enterprise also have a fascination with, um, you know, with space weather and astronomy and all that. And, and I, I just never did. I can tell you, there's like eight and a half planets, and so that's kind of that's about that's about my limit to it. So, uh, but luckily, we got Ricky here, who I know spent hours preparing himself for our space weather show, and he has a whole list of questions, and he's gonna. He's going to take over. So I'll pass the host and duties over to our newly graduated from UNCC, Ricky Matthews. Yeah, thanks, Joey. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess I would consider myself a little bit of a space nerd, probably not as much as Tony is, but uh, I think he actually enjoys having that title. Uh, first off, before we get into everything, I, I did want to take a moment to you know remember a member of the Weather Brains cast. Uh, J.B. Elliott passed away a few days ago, and... I had the pleasure of being on Weather Brains with him, and he was always so nice. And <clears throat> we also had something called Picks of the Week that he did. And if JB didn't have a pick, someone would send him one. Well, Sky Dave usually did that, but there were a few weeks when he was out. So I was actually asked, and a few other people were asked to send JB a link, and he was very appreciative of that and just a nice man overall. So we send our thoughts to his family and friends. But on to our show topic for tonight. Tony, it, you know. Uh, what's your official title, and let's talk a little bit about you know your role as a NASA n ambassador first. So my official title is uh, Solar System Ambassador, and I do this through the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in Pasadena, California. So the program I'm involved in, it's it's it reaches out to people that have an interest in this, this sort of thing, and. It involves some 500 different people across the country. A lot of, not a lot of folks know about it, but uh, we're out there in the museums. We're out there in the classrooms. I, my favorite uh, group to talk to is third graders. I get the opportunity to talk to third graders here in Wake County and uh, also in some surrounding counties. Every once in a while, I get to venture out towards, uh, towards Charlotte and towards the mountains sometimes. I love being able to do that. That's one of the cool things about uh, the, the opportunities I've had through this program is uh, we think about exploring space, but I've gotten to explore North Carolina doing this, talking to uh, different folks. That's awfully cool. But like I say, there's people all over the country that are involved in this sort of thing, and it's uh, managed through JPL. But we're really uh, we're really there to talk about NASA as a whole and and the other space agencies that are involved in these sorts of things. So I also do a little bit of work for the. Uh, Langley Research Center up in Hampton, Virginia, as a part of their uh, Speakers Bureau. So I'll go in when they have uh, requests that come in from this area, and sometimes down in South Carolina, I've gone down and done that some too, uh, go and talk about uh, uh, some of the exciting things that are happening up at Langley as well. Hey, Tony, Tony, I got, I, I got to throw a question at you. Sure. <laughs> Scotty knows what's coming. Me, me and Scotty, we do uh, we do weather talks with uh, mostly fifth graders, uh, mm -hmm. but they stopped me with the question. 
And so I'm throwing it at you since you like to cover uh, cover some uh, some youth classes. Okay. Uh, the question the question was, was it really a weather balloon that crashed in Roswell, or was it aliens? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, NASA provides us some training on those sorts of questions, and I'm, I'm very happy to uh, to say that we've gotten that. Um, I, I tend to dodge those kind of questions. Uh, there, there's just uh, you don't get you get them from the fifth graders and the sixth graders. You don't get them so much from the third graders. The fifth graders are all about uh, impressing each other. I tell you the question I get more often than uh, than that. Um, I, I do get the are there aliens out there question, and. Uh, uh, you know we're free to to give our own personal opinions there, but you know, the the stock answer there is you know we haven't found anything yet. It doesn't mean because we're not looking. And all of the missions that we have out there right now are they're looking for things very much different than aliens. So it, it, if you get really technical and really serious on them, those fifth graders, all those questions just melt away. But the the question I get uh, most often from the third graders has to do with things blowing up. They're just fascinated with rockets blowing up. And up until late last year, the only real topic we had to talk about there when it came to stuff blowing up, unfortunately, was our, our two shuttles that we lost uh, over the years. But as of uh, the end of last year, when uh, we had to detonate a, uh, an Antares rocket that was leaving the pad in Wallops Island, Virginia, which pretty much for everybody that's, that's listening in, in the, the Carolinas and Virginia, uh, you're, you're in a good spot to be able to see things launch from Wallops Island. Uh, and they do a good job of, of getting the information out there about where you have to look and when you have to look, but so on. But So we we lost a rocket. We had to uh, we had to destroy it a couple of seconds after it left the launch pad because uh, it wasn't going the right way. And when they don't go the right way, things get really dangerous, so it's, it's safest to destroy it. But, yeah, that gives me something to talk about with those third graders. They love talking about stuff blowing up. And related to things blowing up and hopefully things not blowing up or being delayed, space weather and meteorology weather kind of really go hand in hand because when you talk about rocket launches, Tony, it's very hard to get a rocket off the ground through the thunderstorm in the area, at least safely, and allow NASA to do everything. So talk a little bit about why NASA has such strict weather standards for their rocket launches and then a little bit about how those forecasts come to fruition. You have touched on one of my favorite topics there, and I'm going to try and bring up my um, my photos here, uh, see if I can share them while I run my mouth. But I got the opportunity to go down to the Kennedy Space Center. Um, it's about two years ago uh, for the MAVEN launch, and, and MAVEN, and we can talk about this too. We can talk about planetary atmospheres, which uh, uh, you guys might be interested in. But MAVEN's a, an orbiter mission that's uh, circling Mars right now, and it's literally sniffing and tasting the air of Mars, uh, trying to understand, quite frankly, what happened to it. Mars' atmosphere used to be a whole lot thicker. So I was down for that um, that launch, and the day before. Uh, I got to spend a little bit of time with the 45th Weather Squadron down there. So the way it works at Cape Canaveral, uh, each site, each launch site is going to have uh, some folks that are supporting weather operations there. And the, the guys and gals at the 45th Weather Squadron are just, they're, they're awesome. They do, they do research. They do, um, they do the operational stuff. They're doing forecasts several days before launch. Their forecasts are available publicly. So before the next SpaceX launch or anything else that's leaving from the Cape, if you go and do a Google search on 45th Weather Squadron or if you follow me on Twitter, I'm going to be retweeting them as well because uh, it's great information to have. Uh, you can see their um, you know, fairly detailed uh, launch forecast. And they're going to spell out all of the things that they're going to be looking at on launch day. And if you look across them, let me see if I can find one real, here, real quick here. And uh, we can look at it in detail. Um, the the detail that they're providing in there is all about the launch constraints. So individual launch constraints. Give me while I Google search myself. And launch forecast. I know where I can find it. I can find it in my own Twitter account. Um, uh, just about every launch commit criteria rule you see in there, it's going to have a story behind it. There was, there's going to be something that 
that went wrong or there's going to be something that um, uh, the research has told them is a problem. And quite a few of them, here we go, let me share this out. Forgive me a moment. Screen share. Not that one, that one. Okay, so what we're looking at right now was the last uh, operations forecast. Uh, this was actually for the Dragon uh, Padabort mission, which was a, a very short lived, very quick mission where uh, they were launching the Padabort test of the Dragon capsule, trying to get it ready for, uh, for use by astronauts. So, uh, so far, the Dragon capsule has been used for nothing but cargo, but we want to be able to regain the capability of launching astronauts from American soil. And this is the first step there. So if you look at a couple of these things, they're going to be looking at things like cloud cover. They're going to be looking at specifically where the, the, the base of the clouds and where the tops are. Um, they're, of course, going to be looking at showers. There's limitations that uh, disallow you from launching through showers. Um, there's uh, surface visibility you have to look at. Uh, that's mostly about imaging the vehicles. We want to be able to have good eyes on them going all the way up. Uh, look at temperature. Uh, the solar flux is actually uh, something that has to be looked at. Uh, there's there's ranges in there. But as you look through all of these things, there's kind of a common theme with all of the per weather parameters that the Air Force is looking at when they make that go, no go recommendation. And it's lightning. Uh, it, as we all know, the, the clouds can tell us the story of, of whether or not we're going to have lightning. But there's even some some factors that you might not think about uh, in just regular weather forecasting. They're very, very important when it comes to launch weather forecasting. If there's a nearby fire, uh, and that happens around the Kennedy Space Center from time to time, there's dry brush and such around there, and wildfires are stopped, we'll, we'll start. That smoke plume uh, can actually create a lightning risk. So those vehicles are going up through the atmosphere so fast that if there were a, uh, a lightning event that would happen, it, the lightning will actually travel down the plume of the rocket. The exhaust that's left behind by the engine, lightning will travel down there. And we've had that happen during the Apollo missions. It basically rebooted the rocket and just about caused an abort. It just about caused us to have to, uh, to re return to the, uh, the launch site. But uh, most of what you see there, it, it's all about uh, protection from lightning. Uh, there's a number of field mills that um, are distributed around the, the Kennedy Space Center. I'm going to put you guys on the spot here. Uh, which one of the panelists can tell me what a field mill is? Maybe our newly minted graduate? Uh, a field what? Field mill. Field mill. Uh... All right, we stumped them. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. So th this is not something that you, you see typically uh, sitting outside your local TV station. Uh, this is something that's going to be very specific to a, a launch site. So what it's doing is, is basically measuring the potential for lightning. Uh, and it, it, it's because these, these vehicles, that they're, as they're ascending so quickly, are generating a fair amount of static electricity. And if there is a, a large charge in the atmosphere, a great amount of charge, it's going gonna, it's gonna to discharge somewhere, and we don't want it discharging down that rocket. Uh, it's going to throw off the, the telemetry, it can fry electronics, and oh yeah, there's a fair amount of fuel on board those, uh, those vehicles, so we don't want that much charge uh, around them. So most of what you see there is, uh, again, around the lightning. So I've, um, I've been down for a couple of launches, a couple of unmanned launches, and uh, several um, uh, space shuttle launches. And the, the gentleman that you hear when you, you tune into a NASA broadcast and hear him doing the countdown. I got to meet him a couple of times, and I, I've, I've kidded him. Uh, the last time I saw him was at the Maven launch. I kidded him, and I said, uh, my wife hates the sound of your voice. And he says, why would you say something so cruel as that? I said, well, uh, she associates your voice with disappointment. She associates your voice with us getting on the bus and, and going back to the hotel room and having to come back the, the next day and do this all over again. Because he's the guy that breaks the bad news of, well, there's this line of uh, uh, cumulus clouds with overshooting anvils um, that have hooked up with another line of cumulus clouds with overshooting anvils, and this has violated the launch weather constraint, and we can't launch today, so we're going to come back the next day. 
But been there before. I was on STS 128, I believe. You were on there. I, I didn't see you on the manifest. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Tell me. Well, I was out there at the Causeway three times. And that was actually the shuttle that got struck by lightning earlier in the week, uh, if I remember correctly. So then we had weather delay it again, and eventually uh, it got delayed so many times all the VIPs wanted to leave. They put us up at the Saturn V Center because uh, no one else was there. We were standing next to the commander's wife <laughs> during launch. I, I had a similar story with, uh, uh, I forget which uh, mission it was, but um, it was a mission where Julie Payette, I believe her name was, mm -hmm. um, a Canadian astronaut, was going up. So we sat in front of the Canadian Space Agency contingent. Boy, they're... Uh, they're a fun crowd, <laughs> <laughs> boisterous and, and, and fun. And yeah, we, uh, my my wife was sitting next to one former astronaut. My son was sitting next to another former astronaut, and we had the CSA behind us. That was a great experience. They're at the Saturn V Center. So when it comes down to you know selection on launch day, how early do they make those forecasts in advance? Um. My experience has been that they start looking uh, no more than, than three or four days out because they're not really so concerned about you know mesoscale. They're they're really looking for, quite frankly, a, a window of just a couple of seconds, and that's why when you see uh, so uh, looking back at what I've got on screen here, you see the the probability of violating launch weather constraints. That's how that's communicated. It's communicated in the negative, but that's their purpose here. They're trying to identify the things that would, would cause them problems. So you look at this and you say on the first day of, um, uh, of, uh, of their forecast, uh, they're basically saying, we got a 70% go probability based on what they're seeing. And they'll also list what their concerns are. In this particular case, it was winds over 25 knots. Uh, and then they'll give a also give a forecast for a 24-hour delay. And different vehicles will have different delay times, but generally 24 hours is about right, especially when you're going to the, the International Space Station. Um, if you miss it on the first day, um, the rule of thumb is you go the next day 24 hours minus, I want to say it's it's like 40 minutes. Uh, I forget. It's the It all has to do with the, the orbit that uh, the ISS is in. But, yeah, they'll start a couple of days ahead of time, and they'll issue a daily forecast the following day and then the day before launch depending on the vehicle and depending on where it's going they may issue one or two additional forecasts but what they're doing there and and I've seen them make launch attempts with uh, as little as you know uh, it'll show up here as 60 or 70 percent day probability of, of violating uh, weather constraints. And that may seem kind of silly. It may seem like a waste of money to even make the attempt because it costs money to make a launch attempt. If there's people that have to be uh, deployed. You've got folks on console. Um, you're going to tire them out if you sit there for a couple hours and don't end up launching. You have to bring more people on console. There's temporary security that's brought on board to do roadblocks and things like that. But the, the fact of the matter is, depending on the vehicle itself, they're really only looking for, like I say, a couple of second window to be able to get that mission off, to be able to get that launch off. And when it comes to a, uh, a mission that's going to the International Space Station, for example, their window is very, very small. So they're going to be a little less um, liberal when it comes to uh, these kind of forecasts. If it doesn't look like a and I'm just throwing numbers out here. Uh, these aren't anything official. It doesn't look like a 50-50 chance of being able to pull that off. They're probably not even going to attempt. But if it's something like the SpaceX mission where you've got a two-hour window, and a window is that amount of time that you can you can get that launch off and and still achieve your objectives. If you've got a two-hour window, hey, we might go for a 60 or 70 no-go. And we might get lucky in there because, again, you're just looking for that little bit of uh, just enough of a window to be able to get that uh, that launch off and get it off successfully. So uh, reiterating, it's uh, a couple of days ahead of time. You'll get uh, daily forecast. They might step it up to twice a day. But when it comes down to the actual launch day, they're watching those numbers live. And um, the, the network of... of um, of instruments that they have across Merritt Island, Florida is just amazing. And the towers actually go about halfway out to Orlando. And they're measuring at winds at, winds at multiple different uh, levels. 
They've got, uh, of course, 3D radars. They can watch cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning, which is not a capability we have elsewhere in um, in the U.S. really, and it's a good thing because they went and put a, a launch facility in one of the most lightning rich areas of the country. I think the only place that has more lightning is uh, is Tampa Bay, but most of that wind weather comes off of the Gulf, uh, comes across the uh, uh, comes across Central Florida, and ends up going hopefully north or south of the Cape, but often goes right over it and ends up having to scrub things. Yeah. So, you know, talking about the missions that they do launch, let's talk a little bit about some of the weather-related space launches that have occurred. I, I know trim off the top of my head, is it MMRS is another one? Uh, and, of course, the GOES satellites? Absolutely. Uh, very few of those, um, it, anything that is going to go into polar orbit is not going to launch from the Kennedy Space Center. Anything that needs to cover uh, a good portion of the planet and is Earth-observing is likely going to be launched from uh, from California, and if you look at the map of California, it'll be pretty obvious why. Uh, and we don't think about these things until we actually look at a, a map with uh, longitude and latitude markers on it. If we were to try and launch a polar satellite from or a polar mission from the Kennedy Space Center, if we went northward with the launch, it would overfly North Carolina. If we went southward with the launch, it would overfly Cuba. Both things are, are not really all that attractive to NASA, so we, we do it from uh, from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, where we can launch due south over the open ocean. It makes perfect sense, although some of us may want to rocket over North Carolina, <laughs> including maybe you and uh, Joey and Scotty. But. Yeah, I'll go to the rockets. That's fine. They don't need to come to me. <laughs> so, you know... Let's talk of specifically about the ghost satellites. I think it's probably the one that's going to be the most familiar to everyone. Can you comment a little bit about, you know, how those were first launched, maybe why, and then any upgrades or anything coming? So that program goes back um, to the early 70s and was originally called um, the Synchronous Meteorological Satellite. And the first one was launched, uh, the anniversary was just this past Sunday, as a matter of fact. Um, shortly afterwards, the second, um, the, the copy of the SMS-1 was launched, the SMS-2, and they were put into orbit about where I believe GOES-14 and 15 are right now, um, over, you know, basically covering the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, SMS-1 ended up just about directly over Brazil. So the reason those were, were launched is to, to give full disk coverage uh, with with imaging and other instruments on board, and do it from a, a geosynchronous orbit. Um, so we've all heard of what a geosynchronous orbit is, but if you kind of step back and think about how how this works and where these things are physically sitting, um, to get something into orbit, uh, we think about distance. We think about how far away it is from the planet's surface. Uh, but the whole purpose of, of launching a rocket, what you're trying to achieve there, isn't so much height. It isn't getting it to some particular place in space, it's speed. Uh, you've got to get up to, in the case of low Earth orbit where the uh, International Space Station is, you've got to get up to 17,500 miles an hour. If you go any slower than that, you're going to feel the effects of the Earth's gravity. It's going to draw it back into uh, uh, the atmosphere and it's going to burn up. The Russians know that well with the, uh, the loss of the Paga spacecraft that um, had some issues uh, launched a couple of weeks back. If you go any faster than that, well, you're no longer in Earth orbit. So as you go farther out, you have to go a little bit faster in order to stay into orbit. So you, you get to the right place, and once you're far enough out, you're then going the same speed as the Earth itself. So that's where we get the geosynchronous orbits from, is uh, 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 any of the GOES satellites, the early SMS satellites, they're going at the same orbital speed, or same rotational speed, I should say, as the Earth. And that keeps it in that same place so that we can observe uh, the, the Earth's surface from that same place. So SMS started, you know, like I say, back in the early 70s. And since then, we've had follow-ons. The program was renamed GOES. And we've had follow-ons that are uh, were up to, um, I think it's 14 or 15. I'd have to look it up. And we have one in storage. Uh, in a storage orbit that sits basically over Mexico, and it's been put into uh, into use. Uh, you probably know this well, Ricky, with uh, 
the Eastern Ghost satellite has had some instrument problems over the last year or so. So we'll we'll move it a little bit out of its orbit and uh, p pull that uh, that spare out of its parking orbit, move it over so that it can image the East Coast very well. And once things get fixed, I'm I'm amazed at the engineers how they can fix things on this operational satellite out there in in, in geo orbit. Uh, get things worked out simply by uploading commands to them. Uh, it's not like we're sending space shuttles out there to repair these things. And once that's repaired, they'll move it back into its uh, its regular orbit. Uh, but to answer your other question, so there, uh, NOAA and NASA are, are constantly working on improved, mostly imaging. We, we think of these, these satellites as being these magical things out there, but they're really just vehicles. They're really just a ride for instruments. The same is true of the planetary instruments, or planetary missions as well. They're all about putting scientific instruments on board. So uh, that's been the, the main improvements that have happened with the GOES satellites over the years is uh, additional imaging capability, better resolution, uh, things like that. So the next one uh, that's being worked on right now is called GOES-R, and the tradition within the, the, the GOES program is uh, a GOES satellite is going to have a letter name until it goes operational. So they're working on GOES-R. It's... Um, right now planned to be launched in 2016, I believe, and once it goes operational, it'll get the uh, the next number in the series. And how is that data sent back? Is there, I guess I'm not really familiar with how rockets get their information back to Earth. I'm assuming satellite dishes, you know, receive signals and everything, but where does it go to and who gets the data? Yeah, there's, uh, there's three ways that uh, information from these satellites get back. Um, uh, one is the, the deep space network, and that one is specific to any planetary missions. So that's probably the one I'm most familiar with, but uh, in, in a nutshell what the deep space network is, and, and anybody that's watching, you can bring up um, a web browser and type uh, into Google DSN now, as in deep space network now, and you'll get a live view of, of what's happening out there in space uh, from all the planetary missions. And you'll see a couple of Mars missions reporting back, and, and maybe even see uh, some of the Voyager missions that are reporting back from outside the solar system. So that's uh, one example of, of how data comes back. And the way Deep Space Network works is there's three very large uh, dish sites with these massive, um, massive dishes that have to be so big because the, the power coming back from these, these missions, especially the ones that are very far out into the solar system, is very, very low. Um, so there's one in Canberra, Australia, which is actually where the Apollo 11 images came down. Uh, that happened to be the side of the Earth that was facing the moon at the time. Uh, so Canberra got those uh, back. There's one outside of Madrid, Spain, and then the third one is about halfway between Las Vegas and Los Angeles in the California desert. Um, so that's, that's one. The other is the Tedris network, and some of the weather satellites, uh, and actually all of the Earth observing satellites, uh, you mentioned TRIM, um, there's the SMAP soil moisture mission that um, was launched uh, a little while ago, and there's the A train of um, uh, Aurora, and uh, the the other ones are escaping me, but there, there's a number of um, of Earth observing missions that are in polar orbit that are totally focused on on the Earth's surface and measuring things like cloud tops, sea salinity, uh, the the frost line, things like that. All of those are coming to the TDRS network, and that stands for Tracking Data Relay Satellite. Uh, that is also used by the Space Shuttle uh, back when it was in flight, and is today used by the International Space Station. So if you ever turned on NASA TV and seen line of images from the, uh, the International Space Station, that's coming through TDRS. So the GOES satellites do make some use of that. Uh, that's downlinked to two base stations. One is in... Um, White Sands, New Mexico, and I suspect it's probably servicing mostly that, that Western Ghost satellite. And then the other one is at Wallops Island in Virginia. Uh, all that data comes into those two base stations and is sent to the NOAA headquarters in uh, Maryland where they make use of it. Did I ramble for 10 minutes and answer your question, or did I just ramble for 10 minutes? No, no that, I get it. Now that I... Now that you mentioned Wallops, I remember being up at Wallops and seeing that now. Um, I think it's near the runway or something up there. Maybe you know better, but uh, I remember seeing specifically what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the downlink station. I have I have a little half question here, Tony. 
Uh, can you tell us why the weather model that uh, the Euro and all that GFS stuff has been totally off the off the charts the past couple of months? I know it has to do with a lot of with the satellite run-ins and stuff like that, half jokingly. But how do how do we uh, get that data in from the satellites that the Euro model goes off of and GFS model goes off of? Uh, the the Euro model is um, uh, that's out of my uh, subject matter expert area, but uh, my understanding is that that's all through cooperation with um, uh, European partners, and my understanding is that that, uh, that kind of data, unlike the data that's coming from NASA-based and NOAA-based satellites, uh, they charge for. So it's not like something that you can go on, uh, you know, europeanweather.co.uk UK or whatever, and download those sorts of things. You have to have they have subscription models around that, and it's not cheap. I know WeatherBell and, and some other providers will allow you some access to it. That's a little bit less expensive, but yeah, they've got their own um, their own downlink stations. Uh, the only unique uh, space data uh, network is that deep space network. Um, the the Americans have their uh, TDRS network that's that's used for their satellites. Europeans have some of their own ways of doing it. The Japanese have some of their own ways of doing it. I think uh, Joey has a question, maybe. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I got a viewer question from one of our regular viewers, uh, Lynn. First off, she want to say that it's exciting stuff tonight because she's a third grade teacher. Cool. Uh, so uh, she says, uh, well, for one, Lynn, I know you're still watching. Well, I'll get you Tony's information. Maybe y'all can get together and you can uh, visit her school one day. Um, but uh, she said, I could probably point her at somebody who can closer to her, wherever she happens to be. We got ambassadors all over everywhere. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll get those information switched out with the two of y'all to make that happen. But um, she says that her kids beg every year to watch the space shuttle blow up, and every year they have to have a discussion on being respectful to their families. Um, she says we're also uh, totally loving the new space shuttles and how super far we've come in space technology. But what she's wondering is. What in the world does a jet propulsion specialist do in North Carolina? Well, we talk to third graders and get them excited about this sort of thing. Yeah, so my day job, I work for Cisco Systems, and uh, I'm an information security specialist. I'm an engineer with them. But uh, this is just something I really enjoy doing. I had a lot of background in it in, uh, in college and uh, just love doing it. And it gives me the opportunity to do a little bit of writing about it and uh, you know, just basically get people excited about it. Awesome. Well, that being up. said, I've got to give the North Carolina link here. Uh, mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot of um, NASA contracts going to North Carolina companies. There is a couple. There's a lot of work that happens at the major universities that are on North Carolina. I'm sorry, on on NASA grants. Um, but one uh, bit of history to the space program uh, you folks may not know about is there is a little company outside of Asheville called AB Emblem. They're just north of Asheville. They have produced patches for the space program since the beginning of NASA just about. So their, their three major customers are, are NASA, so any of those uh, patches you see on an astronaut's uniform or, or, or suit going back to, you know, to the Mercury era, those came out of North Carolina. Um, their other big uh, contract was with the military, so they produce a lot of the, the flags and, and things like that that you see on, on our, our military uniforms. The other is the Boy Scouts. So we're pretty proud of, uh, of AB out there in, in Asheville. Very cool. Uh, well, Tony, one thing maybe um, us who are not as experienced in, in astronomy like you are, talk to us a little bit about what we can see just from the naked eye, maybe meteor showers, uh, auroras, ISS, Passover, stuff like that. Yeah, that's that's something I, I love talking about. And, uh, Ricky, you just got added to an email list whether you like it or not. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> That, that's something I'm very passionate about, and I, I've put together an email list that's been going for a couple of years now, and it started out as information I was passing on to my local astronomy club about observing um, what things were going to be visible. Uh, it, it was very practical to start out with. It was, um, you know, when's the sunset, when's the sunrise, uh, what planets are going to be visible overnight. And it's kind of morphed into what you refer to right there, naked eye astronomy. So now I've got 65... TV meteorologists around the country that I send this information to on a weekly basis because I want them, again, to get people excited about this sort of thing. So some of the kind of things that you can see with the naked eye, and let me just uh, bring up my, my notes here and I'll look at the last um, email that went out. Uh, hey, but, while you're at it, 
I'm looking that up, you can add us to that list, and we'd love to pass to. along the information to our followers. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So this is, uh, and actually the timing works out uh, pretty well. Um, it, I, I can make sure it gets to you right before you have your, your Wednesday uh, your Wednesday sessions. But let's bring up, well, we'll bring up Raleigh, North Carolina, just because. Um, so the, the last bit of information was sent out, and, and this will kind of answer your question about what kind of things you can see. Uh, we're looking for things like conjunctions. So when a planet gets very close to another one as we see it from our position here on Earth, that's pretty exciting because you can take your, your friends out and you can take your kids out and you can point out and you see that dot up in the sky there? And that may look like a star, but it's not. It's the planet, you know, whatever. So we've got... Um, We've got conjunctions that happen every couple of weeks. Those are pretty cool. We can see Saturn very close to the moon, for example, or Jupiter very close to the moon. Or sometimes they'll, they'll form uh, a triangle that makes them very easy to see. Anytime you can pick out these kind of things, because the sky is very, very big, so sometimes it's difficult to, to pick out a, a particular uh, uh, planet or, or whatever. So that, that, those are cool things to, to point out. Um, right now, if you go out shortly after sunset, um, about 20 degrees off of the horizon, uh, you're going to see Mercury. Uh, and that's if you have a fairly good sky and don't have a whole lot of light pollution. But if you do have a fair amount of light pollution, if you're in downtown Raleigh or Charlotte or whatever, um, you can still look another 20 degrees up and you're going to see Venus. So it's just kind of cool that you can, you can see these things with your naked eye. Uh, some other naked eye events that you might be able to catch are um, uh, things like meteor showers. And we have... Uh, about four or five of those that are, are pretty pretty active and pretty bright. So which one of you guys can tell me what produces a meteor shower? What are those things we're actually seeing in the sky? Some, somebody jump on that question for me. Or asteroid debris? Asteroid or comet debris, yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. So the last one we just went through was actually Halley's Comet. Uh, we're passing through the tail of, of Halley's Comet. Uh, and that's the uh, Eta Aquarius, uh, and that actually continues until the end of this month, um, and can be fairly bright and fairly uh, active, uh, but we've not made a whole big deal about that right now because uh, they were mostly active during a full moon. So that's the other thing you got to consider is these uh, meteor showers happen around the same time every year because, again, we're passing through the debris, the tail of a comet, or passing through the tail uh, or, or uh, debris left behind from, from an asteroid. It's usually a comet. Uh, so it's the same point in our path around the sun that we hit it, so it's going to happen at the same date. But what does change from year to year is what the moon's doing. And if it's a full moon, we're really not going to see a whole lot because uh, I can often read a newspaper by the, the full moon. It's really bright. It's really going to wash the sky out. So those kind of things we point out. So the next major meteor showers that we're going to see um, the Perseids in August, uh, they're going to peak August 12th. Um, that's a really good one. Those are very, very bright. And it's going to happen during a new moon, which is ideal. Uh, it doesn't get much better than that. And that's coming uh, off the, the the back end of this comet uh, uh, 109P Swift-Tuttle. Uh, they don't have real sexy names, but uh, they're enough to keep them straight. And the next one after that, really big one, is going to be the Geminids. And we always mark our calendar for that one because that can be a, a really... Um, uh, a really good one. Uh, that's going to peak uh, Sunday, December the 13th, I believe it is. And um, we have ways of measuring these meteor showers. Uh, there's one called uh, Zenith Hourly Rate. And it, when you hear these discussed um, in the newspaper, on TV, or you might see them on websites and things like that, when they talk about how many meteors you might see per hour, that's probably the number they're referring to is the Zenith hourly, hourly Rate. But something to understand about that number is it's an absolute ideal. Um, so it's for, uh, the, the zenith part means directly overhead, so that's going to be the, the brightest, uh, since you have the least amount of atmosphere between you and, and what you're looking at. It also assumes that uh, you're just about in the middle of desert when it comes to light pollution, so you don't have much light pollution uh, affecting you. So when you hear a number like, you're going to see 100 meteors per hour. Uh, if you're in the suburbs, you can just about have that. Um, if you're in the, the city, you can have that again or even more so. So just be aware that those numbers are approximations and, and that they're, um, uh, they're based on ideals. That being said, though, um, uh, a, a 
notable uh, uh, comet hunter has said that, that these things are like cats. They, they have tails and they do whatever they damn please. So some years you're going to have uh, 20 meteors per hour and the next year you might have 200. You just don't know until we hit that part of the dis debris stream. Uh, we're hitting a little bit different part of it every time we go around the sun. So some years are going to be great and some years are going to be off. So that's uh, one thing that we can look out for. You mentioned the International Space Station, and that's just tons of fun to look out for. Uh, so I think most of the people watching are, are somewhere in North Carolina or Virginia or, or South Carolina. So these numbers are going to be approximately right, but I'll give you a website that you can go to that will give you the exact ones. So today's the 13th. We missed a really good pass this morning. So 5.14 a.m. this morning, the International Space Station uh, appeared in the southwestern sky, and it was in the sky for about six minutes. It, it, and this is These are Raleigh numbers. They're going to be a little bit different for... Uh, the rest of the state, the rest of the area, but close enough. Um, and it reached up to about 78 degrees above the horizon. And what these numbers mean, the horizon is zero degrees, directly overhead is 90 degrees. So 78 is just about overhead. You're going to have trouble figuring uh, out the difference between 78 and 90. They're, they're that close. Those are great because uh, when it comes that close to being directly overhead, it's really, really close to you and it's going to be really bright. So the next good one to look for is um, is on Saturday at 4.11 in the morning, and that's going to come from the northeast. That's going to last about three minutes. So uh, I, I can hear you guys groaning already. I'm not getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning to see this. <laughs> I am. I'm already <laughs> looking at that. There you go. <laughs> but uh, the, the way it works is uh, it's visible um, a few hours before sunrise, a couple uh, every couple of weeks and a few hours after sunset every couple of year, weeks. And what you're seeing is, and the reason it's so close to sunset or sunrise, you're seeing the, the International Space Station being lit by the sun, yet the, uh, the terminus has already passed over us. We're already in nighttime, but it's up a couple hundred miles away, so it's still sunlight up there. Now, the station's passing over us all the time. We just don't see it because of, uh, because of sunlight or because it's not itself lit. Tony, you mentioned uh, you mentioned having a dark sky. Is there? I, I've seen a website somebody shared with me before, but is there a, a way you can find so that you can maybe find an area near your home that's darker or anything like that, so maybe you can see these things a little bit better? Yeah, there's uh, there's a couple of um, of websites out there. I'll, I'll have to look them up and, and maybe share them uh, later with you guys. Uh, but there, there are some dark sky directories. There's a couple that I know of off the top of my head that I know my astronomy club and some of the other astronomy clubs make use of. Um, there's the Medoc Mountain State Park in North Carolina, and it's out uh, a little bit to the east. It's um, not too far from Rocky Mount, uh, but it's, it is a mountain and does get you a little bit above... Um, some of the light pollution. It's fairly dark out there. And on any given weekend, there's generally some amateur astronomers that are out there with their uh, with their telescopes, and they'll be up all night observing because it's it's such a nice dark site that they're able to uh, to get some really good views. And they're more than happy to share. Uh, so if you if you're a camper, uh, that's a great place, especially tent camping, to go out and. Uh, uh, wait till after dark, and you'll you'll see the crazy guys with the expensive telescopes out there. <laughs> go go approach them, and they'll they'll show you some cool stuff. Um, another good one. Uh, let me look it up. A Staunton River State Park in Virginia. It's just over the border, um, uh, kind of towards uh, Danville, uh, but it is a Virginia State Park. Now that's a a park that uh, the Chapel Hill Astronomy Club has done a lot of work with. And they're currently seeking a dark sky park designation. Uh, the park there has done some uh, some improvements where they've improved their lighting uh, within the park. And actually the town very close to there has also improved their lighting because they see this as a resource. They see this uh, as something that people are going to be interested in. Not just amateur astronomers, but folks that want to go out camping uh, and that want to uh, you know go out and rent campus and things like that, they're trying to get away from the city. So getting rid of some of that light pollution just makes it uh, so much more of a, a, a pleasant mm -hmm. experience. But they're working on uh, getting a, a dark, sky, um, dark sky park designation. So that's a good one. 
Do you know of any off the top of your head in the western North Carolina area? Not off the top of my head. You guys are kind of blessed with um, with some dark skies out there already, uh, except for the uh, occasional sodium vapor light on the side of somebody's barn that can <laughs> light up half a county. <laughs> True that. Uh, Tony, I have a question, and it's something I've always wondered about. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit exactly? I know we don't really get to see them here in the Carolinas, but the northern lights, I mean, what, what causes that? And, and the, the pictures I see from, from people who get to see it are just beautiful. We do get to see them occasionally, and we're not going to see them in, in the way that uh, show up in those, those images. We're not going to see the, the ribbons of light. We're not going to see uh, the multicolored lights. But uh, they have been seen as far south as Florida. Uh, it does happen from time to time. Uh, so what's happening there is, now let me back up a, a minute. The, the, the story here is why we don't see them uh, very often. Uh, so we have around our planet what's called a magnetosphere. And it's a, a magnetic belt around the, uh, the planet that is very, very important. It, it, it provides us protection from the sun. Uh, if it weren't for uh, the magnetosphere being there, uh, we probably couldn't spend a whole lot of time outside. The amount of energy that would be passing through um, the atmosphere and reaching us would just be too much. We, we wouldn't have the kind of technology we have today. The power grid would look very, very different. That being said, uh, it's there, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and it really doesn't change shape a whole lot, so it's just there doing its thing. The reason that we see occasional burst of the, the northern lights or the southern lights, that it happens on the south end of the planet as well, is because of the continual changes in our sun. So uh, NASA's got a, a fleet of spacecraft that are monitoring the sun for these very things. And um, NOAA and NASA have uh, monitoring systems in place on the ground that monitor solar activity and try to give us some warning when these things are, are, are coming our way. So when there's something like a coronal mass ejection, basically the, 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 the sun burps and sends a lot of energy our way. Uh, that can drive down the the line where those kind of um, northern lights are, are are visible, and sometimes it'll be even driven down as far as we are uh, down into into central North Carolina or even farther south. Now, the last time that I saw any rural activity in North Carolina, uh, it amounted to a slight greening of the um, of the the northern skyline. You could definitely see that it was there. And that's where it was coming from. So the way to think about where the the northern lights are most visible, and this is the example I give the kids. The kids love this one. Think of a big old Krispy Kreme donut. Think of a Krispy Kreme donut big enough to fit around our planet. So all that uh, all that cakey and uh, and glazy goodness is going to cover uh, from about north of the uh, of the tropics, uh, the Tropic of Capricorn, Tropic of Cancer. It's going to cover those areas. Now, the top and the bottom of that are going to be open. That's where those northern lights are most visible. So that's why the Canadians and the, um, uh, and the, the folks that live in uh, the northern parts of Alaska uh, and the uh, northern Europe are going to be able to see that a whole lot more than we are. When you start comparing it to donuts, you get this fat guy's attention. <laughs> <laughs> i got to keep it North Carolina local. <laughs> <laughs> One other kind of question I have, and I'll toss it back to Ricky, kind of connect them with the northern lights is we hear a lot about uh, the solar flares and stuff like that. We even, you know, our local guy here in Charlotte, Brad Panovich, talks about it. Um, we see a lot of stuff passed around on the Internet. Why are they so important to us, and what does it cause in our daily life that we notice when that happens? Was that a, a question for... Uh... For you, yeah, I'm sorry. For you. Okay, no problem. Uh, so that's it, it's very important, and and like I say, it's uh, it relates back to the technology we have in place today, and is uh, really impacts that. And I'll give you two examples of um, organizations, companies that are going to be monitoring space weather very, very closely. Uh, and if you go to uh, the NOAA Space Weather Pr Prediction Center, you can see some live readouts of, of what's coming in right now. And they're going to measure things like um, uh, X-ray flux, proton flux, and especially geomagnetic activity. Uh, the, the changes in, in, um, in geomagnetic uh, fields uh, are, are an indication of, uh, of what we might be seeing through space weather. And uh, remind me to get back to geomagnetic activity because uh, there's a Virginia... Um, 
connection there. Not North Carolina, but Virginia. So uh, there's two organizations, two types of companies that are going to be monitoring this very closely. One is uh, Power, somebody like Duke Power um, or any of the other big power companies around. They're going to be paying very close attention. They probably have this NOAA page up somewhere in their operations center. It looks like Mission Control. They got the big screens up on the wall. They're monitoring lots of different things about their power network, but they're also monitoring space weather. And the reason for that is if there's some sort of a, uh, uh, an influx of energy, um, like a, a coronal mass ejection, for example, that energy's got to go somewhere. And if it's strong enough, it's going to make it through the... Um, the magnetosphere, it's going to make it down to Earth, and it's got to be dissipated somehow. So one thing that one way that it can be dissipated is through our power network. So all these power lines that are strung throughout the uh, throughout the state and beyond, they can pick up that energy, and it's going to be introduced into the power network, uh, and that can cause all sorts of damage within that equipment. Uh, if they know it's coming, they can prepare for it. They can funnel some of that energy off into the ground if necessary, but it's basically going to protect their equipment. And if their equipment is protected, they don't have to replace it, and hopefully our rates don't go up. So that's one um, one type of industry that's going to be interested in that. Another industry that's going to be very interested in that is going to be aviation and you know, shipping, um, transportation in general. So in the example of aviation, if you've ever had the opportunity to fly to uh, Asia, for example, um, if you're very, very lucky, you got to go over the pole. Um, if you fly to a destination like that, let's say we're flying from Chicago to Beijing, uh, if you take the long way around, if you go around the side of the planet, it's quite a bit longer, it takes a longer time, uh, it's going to use significantly more fuel, it's more expensive. Uh, but if the space weather is calm enough and we don't feel like we're going to be exposing people to significant amounts of radiation, we can go up over that top of that Krispy Kreme donut, and uh, it's a much shorter route. That's the um, uh, the Great Circle route. Um, allows us to go up over the poles and uh, and shorten that way. But if there's a, a solar event going on at the time, you can't risk it. Um, it's a very low amount that the passengers are going to be receiving. Uh, it's in a couple of hours what we would probably receive in a couple of weeks. But anyway, uh, it's the flight crews that we got to think about because they're the ones that are, are spending so much time up there. So the airlines are going to be paying lots of attention to that. Uh, and shipping, the, the, the large cargo, cargo ships that are coming, you know, mostly across the Pacific, uh, they have to think about these sort of things because a large coronal mass ejection is going to affect their radios. They're not going to be able to communicate. And they never want to be out of uh, touch with, uh, uh, with the mainland. So there's, that's just a couple of examples of a, a few industries that are going to be paying attention to stuff like that. So it's not just about the pretty northern lights. It, it can actually cause some cause some havoc on uh, on Earth. Well, Tony, that that's very uh, inf informative because you know we hear these all the time. But I honestly, we we get a couple questions. I honestly don't know the the true answers to that. So I appreciate that. Just remember um, the donut. The donut. That's right, Krispy Kreme. I mean, you know. So you can't forget Krispy Kreme. I think Ricky's having some internet issues. I think he's back on. So, Ricky, I'm going to toss it to you. I'm out of questions. I don't know if you have a few more or or, or what. Uh, I've kind of been in and out. Yeah, we had an internet issue, and then I was stupid and closed the page twice, and that's why it kept going <laughs> out. But uh, Tony, uh, let's go ahead and end the show a little bit with a few links or just websites that you know where people can get information. If they're interested in space weather, where can they go? or if they're interested in space in general, where can they go? Okay, so nasa.gov is obviously a, a very good place to uh, to check out. And uh, it's recently gone through a, a redesign. Uh, so there's, um, it used to be that uh, individual NASA locations, be it JPL or NASA headquarters or down at the Cape, uh, they kind of maintained their own site and it was a little bit disconnected. Now it's all under one, uh, so that's a, a really good one, nasa.gov. Let me find the teacher page, because I know you got some teachers uh, mm. that are watching. And this just recently got put back online, um, but there's some really good resources there that you can do searches based on the uh, the grade level that you're working with and, and find some fun things to do in class. And a lot of them are even keyed back to... Um, 
the uh, the Common Core curriculum or or other curriculums, so that you can go in and figure out if there's some particular thing you're trying to accomplish that week in class. You can go find just the right activity to work with them. So um, Google's actually your friend here. NASA Education is a great thing to Google, but nasa.gov slash offices slash education um, has got things for uh, there's a NASA Kids Club there. There's uh, specific sites for educators, for students. The one for educators I will, will call out because that's a, a great one. The, I hope our third grade teacher will, will take a look at that uh, because not only are there you know, the resources like I mentioned, the videos and, and classroom activities, uh, but there's also some opportunities for teachers uh, to go to NASA sites and uh, experience some things. Uh, one uh, opportunity I saw that just came up recently was on the SOFIA mission. And uh, SOFIA is a 747SP. It's one of the, the short variants of the, S, the 747. It lives out at the, uh, the Dryden, which is now called the uh, Armstrong Research Center in the desert of California. They cut a hole in the side of this plane and stuck a giant telescope out the side. There's an opportunity for teachers to go take a ride on this and they're not just there as tourists. They're they're doing the science alongside the the other uh, scientists aboard, and they get trained um, ahead of time. But these are some great experiences that that are open for teachers. There's some stipends involved with it sometimes to help with travels, um, d depending on the the opportunity. But there's lots of these kind of things that are available, and then they can bring these experiences back to their class and and really get kids excited about it. So NASA.gov is one of them. Um, swpc.noaa.gov, the Space Weather Prediction Center, is a great one. And I love these kind of dashboards where you can just kind of leave it up during the day and watch the data come in, especially if we're seeing some, uh, some solar flux. It's fun to watch that kind of thing happen. Uh, another good one is, again, just Google DSN Now. And uh, let me bring this one up real quick and, and share it. Where did it go? There it is. So this one's just awesome. Uh, so right now uh, we've got SOHO, which is a solar mission that's talking to the Goldstone antennas. MSL, that's our Curiosity rover. Uh, that's uh, the, the bigger of the two operational rovers there. MRO is Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's talking right now. Juno is on its way to Jupiter. TEST is just what you expect it to be. They're testing the dish. Uh, MRO is, looks like it's handing off from Canberra to, to Goldstone. Um, MAVEN is the uh, atmospheric mission that I mentioned earlier. So this is the kind of stuff that's live. You're actually seeing the same data the, the engineers are seeing out there. So th these are the kind of things that are a whole lot fun to, um, uh, to throw up and watch throughout the day. I'm trying to think if there's any other... Uh, oh, I, I need, need to show you this one too. So, Evans. This will give you your ISS predictions. So, All right. Heaven, Heavens-above.com, you can enter your longitude and latitude, and it will give you the uh, predictions on when you can see the, the shuttle. And, and other cool things go over, too. You can actually see the Chinese Space Station go over, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, if you're at a low enough latitude, you can see that go over. Lots of cool stuff to see go over. Cool. All righty. Awesome, and with that, I'll throw it to Sky. Yeah, Tony, the last last thing, uh, you had mentioned it just a little, little while ago. Uh, if we do have any uh, guests or any viewers who are interested, how can they get in touch uh, with maybe a local astronomy club? Do you have any information on that? Oh, yeah, so... Uh, and this is true for anywhere in the U.S. It isn't just in North Carolina. Uh, so NASA maintains something called the Night Sky Network. And if you go to clubs and events, you can find, I'm, I'm logged in as myself right now, so it's showing things that are specific to my area. Uh, but you can go in and enter your, uh, your zip code, and it will find a astronomy club near you. Now, there's lots of astronomy clubs around. The Night Sky Network is a series of astronomy clubs that are all about outreach. So they're the folks that have public viewing events uh, that will share these giant telescopes that people have gone and invested thousands of dollars in. But they're also going to have some other educational events, too, where you can 
learn about how the planets were formed, lifetimes of stars, how the telescopes themselves work. So Night Sky Network is a, a great one to look at. And that's nightsky.jpl.nasa.gov. Awesome. I, want, well, uh, I think Joey's got those links. We'll definitely throw those up on our uh, Facebook page. And uh, for those who are watching tonight interested, definitely can go and check those out. Uh, Tony, we appreciate you coming on. Uh, and I know we were supposed to have you back a couple months ago, but we got severe weather. And so we're very appreciative that you were on tonight. And if you want to, uh, I know you are active on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, maybe if you want, want to share your Twitter handle or anything like that, feel free to. So I'm uh, at RTP Hokey. There's me right there. And uh, I tweet out all sorts of uh, space-related stuff. But i got to pimp my other site, too. My other... Uh, <laughs> This one I'm, I'm real proud of. This is the Mars Weather Report. So it's uh, Mars WX Report. And what this is is data that's coming directly off that uh, Mars Science Lab, off the Curiosity rover. There's a series of meteorological instruments on board that are measuring things like ground temperature, air temperature, uh, radiation. The most interesting one is pressure, though. If you look at these latest readings here, let me bring up... Uh, actually, it just, uh, just came in just a few seconds ago. Um, we can see the, the high on Mars on May 11th was negative uh, 3 Celsius, so the low was negative 73 Celsius. So it's still pretty cold there right now. But check out that pressure in hectopascal. So I'm going to put our, our resident broadcast met on the spot again and tell me uh, why this uh, 8.41 hectopascals is significant. What would that like, compare to in the, the, the current pressure here on Earth? Uh, a really, really low pressure. Very, very low. <laughs> about one percent that of Earth. So that's kind of the story on Mars. Is uh, not a whole lot of um, whole lot of atmosphere left. So we're trying to figure out what happened there. But yeah, Mars WX report is uh, it's coming out daily uh, or approximately daily, uh, depending on what other kind of data is coming down from there at the time. But this is lots of fun because you can see how cold it is on Mars and how little pressure there is. So I take from that. Mars can be completely sunny and still not get above freezing like we do here in the mountains. So there you That's go. a fact, yeah. <laughs> well, Tony, we appreciate you being on tonight. And uh, you also, um, a lot of our followers also watch Weather Brains. You also have a segment on that every week. I do. I have a contribution there uh, every week. Uh, it's a, a pre recorded um, segment that, that goes up uh, usually Monday morning so they can make use of it in the, uh, that evening. And it's uh, 90 seconds to two minutes. We call it the Astronomy Outlook. Uh, we come up with um, some sort of an event that's coming up that week. Uh, sometimes it's something in the sky. Sometimes it's uh, related to something we're putting up in the sky, if there's a particular launch or something come up. But, yeah, I, I, I contribute to uh, Weather Brains once a week. They're lots of fun to work with. And if I'm not mistaken, people in the uh, Raleigh area right now, they can watch you sometimes on WRAO. Yeah, I show up there every once in a while, but... Um, uh, at least once a week and sometimes more. Um, if, if you find this kind of stuff interesting, uh, definitely uh, check out the WRL.com weather blog. So I contribute to there once a week. Uh, but the other meteorologists there are contributing just some incredible stuff about uh, uh, the, the local climate and uh, uh, there's lots of good stuff about severe weather and such there. So it's a really good read. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you coming on once again tonight. And, um, you're going to email us that list of some things that will be passing in the sky, and we'll definitely pass that along to our followers. And uh, definitely uh, direct people back to your Twitter account and your uh, Mars Weather account. That's pretty cool as well. Cool. And, 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 Tony, just to clear up, because we get this question every year, numerous times, the blue moon is not blue and the pink moon is not pink, correct? It, it is not. The coloration of the moon is due to the atmosphere, so you're only going to see those color changes when it's very close to the horizon and you're looking through the maximum amount of atmosphere. The blue moon comes from frequency, at least the name does, uh, more than anything else. There's a whole list of, uh, of names we've come up with over the years, and each culture has a different name for uh, the full moon each month, believe it or not. And the super moon is not four times the size of the sun and will make the whole sky light up bright, right? Oh, I, I've grown to tolerate the super moon. It, it drives me insane. It does not get as big as uh, some hype it to be, but hey, if it's going to get people outside looking at it, I'm, I'm all for it. Speaking of that, though, before we go, because I don't think we asked this question, um, 
the the moon and when it becomes a super moon does actually have a few effects on the Earth, correct? It, it does, and uh, there's been some hurricanes that have coincided with full moons and full super moons uh, that have uh, it's actually increased the effects of those uh, of that weather. So our our moon is uh, is in an orbit that takes it. Uh, sometimes it's farther away from the Earth, sometimes it's closer to the Earth. So the amount of light that's coming off the moon, that's what a full moon is. It's, it's fully illuminated. That's not going to have any impact on, on, uh, on gravity or on the tides or anything like that. But it being closer, so uh, when it's at apogee, uh, that's when it's as far away as it can be. When it's at perigee, then it's very much closer. If those kind of weather, uh, severe weather events are, are occurring at the moon's perigee, uh, we're going to have higher tides, and that can impact the coastline. So, yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And uh, do you happen to know of any events that coincided with that? I'm I'm a, I'm a weather history guy. So, <laughs> trying to think. Um, I want to say that last big storm that went up through New York City. Uh, help me here. Um, Sandy. Thank you. Uh, happened during um, happened during perigee, and increase the effects on the coastline, if I'm remembering correctly. My next question will be, is there anywhere I can look up past perigee events so that I know when those occurred so hmm. I can coincide that data with some major hurricanes and things of that, that nature? So you can map, map them back. You, you want the, uh, the, the trig formula to figure it out on your own? Do I look like I want the trig formula <laughs> to figure it out on my own? <laughs> I'll send you a good site where you've got the uh, the history of the apogee and perigee. Awesome, because I do not want to do that much math. <laughs> uh, come on, Joey, you can do it. And as much as as much as everybody knows, I'm a huge math fan, and I, I loved math in school. And uh, yeah, I'd rather not do any more than I have to. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, Tony, thanks again so much uh, for coming on, and maybe the next big uh, solar event or something like that, we can uh, have you on for a couple minutes. You kind of. Talk to us about what's going on, and uh, we'd love to have you back on. Absolutely, and I'll start feeding you some uh, some weekly information and help you call out a couple of things that will be fun for people to look out for. Awesome. And I'm telling you, you've been ahead. I've got several text messages and, and uh, Facebook messages about uh, having you on the show. Uh, a lot of people are finding this stuff really cool. I, I know uh, Lynn, actually, uh, she wants me to give you her email address and maybe... Uh, you can email her so she can share it with her class as well. So I know you're passing along, yeah, that. absolutely. Yeah, that's the the cool thing about weather and space is uh, uh, so many people I run into had at, at least an interest in it when they were kids, either weather or space or both. So uh, I like to say that these are gateway sciences. They they get people interested in a lot of other sciences too. And, and it's something that everybody can experience. Everybody can look up at the at the sky and everybody can experience weather from time to time. That's so. a fact. And, and, well, and, and maybe we can take them a step further than those styrofoam balls that we make the solar system model out of. <laughs> Joey, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't ask him about Pluto tonight. Oh, <laughs> not that topic. <laughs> That's, I, like I said, eight and a half planets, right? <laughs> yeah. Let me close out with one thing, if you don't mind, and since you brought yeah, up Pluto. Definitely. So in July, everybody keep their ear out for this. We're going to finally get some good pictures of Pluto. So we've had a spacecraft going out there for seven or eight years that's going uh, a couple 40, 50,000 miles an hour at this point. It's the fastest thing that man has ever created. So it's called New Horizons, and it's going to reach Pluto in mid-July. So keep your ear out for that. Uh, it's actually going to take quite a while for those pictures to come back because it's so far out there. We had to put kind of a small dish on that uh, spacecraft to get it out there in just a couple of years instead of a couple of decades. But New Horizons is, is heading out to Pluto, and we're going to go whizzing by, taking as many pictures as we can on our way there. Then we're going to kind of continue on out and s study beyond the, the, the solar system and bring some great images back. And uh, it, it sounds a little macabre to some, but I actually think it's kind of cool. Uh, the gentleman who discovered Pluto, it was the first American to s discover a planet. His name was Clyde Tombaugh. Uh, a little bit of his ashes are on board that spacecraft. So he's getting to go to Pluto. I think that's kind of cool. That is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that is definitely neat. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, one thing I want to make sure any of the teachers who are listening or if we have any kids that are listening, if they want a career at NASA, they better start paying attention to math, right? 
Math, 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 math. Yes, absolutely. But uh, uh, you know, when I ask this question of uh, of astronauts or, or any of the sciences uh, scientists, they talk about being uh, having a broad education too. They want you to be broad, but they want you to go deep on something that re really makes you passionate. I talk to the folks that run the the, the Mars rovers that, that are responsible for planning those things out every day, and they've got just a wide variety of, of backgrounds. Some of them are roboticists. Some of them are, are chemists, but each one of them, yeah, you're absolutely right. The math is really, really important. Yeah. Little, little do you know, it's not just a... An and aim with a scope like a rifle and shoot it for a point. There's a lot of math involved in getting in getting the rockets and satellites there. And they're good at it. <laughs> so, but uh, but yeah, and also there, uh, don't mistake your Mars rover data with the Twitter account, the sarcastic rover, who is quite funny, I might add. That that is a <laughs> funny account. I, I enjoy watching that one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we appreciate it, Tony, once again, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back on soon. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Uh, another great episode again. Uh, if you want to download it on the podcast, we'll have that up tomorrow morning. And as always, you can uh, rewatch this here on the uh, YouTube broadcast. So next week, I will not be here, so I'm going to hand it over to Joey, and Joey's going to tell you about what the show is going to be about next week. Scotty is handed it over to me because he cannot pronounce our next guest's name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not going to be here. This, this, uh, so and, I'm not going to about it. And to be honest with you, luckily we have a pre-show where I can make her say her name a couple of times so that I can pronounce it properly. <laughs> uh, but we are going to have uh, Lord. I'm going to try to butcher it. Lord Ablis on. Um, she is going to come on and discuss her book, uh, which let me get you the proper name of because it's a quite long name. Uh, but it's a book. It's um. Uh, it's by the storm, 1938, a social and meteorological history of the Great New England Hurricane. It's basically a book about the Great New England Hurricane that struck in 1930. I believe she has another book that is um, in the process of being done. I don't know how far she. She's also a professor at uh, Plymouth, is it Plymouth State University? Um, Plymouth, Plymouth, New Hampshire. She, she's a she's a professor there, so she has a, she's a very 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 busy lady. We're going to have a guest panelist. Uh, some of you guys might remember Cameron Self, a uh, UNCC graduate um, who has been on the show before, who's a tropical meteorologist with Impact Weather. He's going to come on as a guest panelist because he said, I think um, I asked him if he wanted to come on for that show. He said, heck yes. He is a tropical guy, and he loves uh, tropical history. So uh, next week, even though Scotty's nice hair won't be here, we'll make sure Cam gets nice hair when he shows up to take Scotty's place. Yeah, well, we'll have some nice hair represent. I, I will actually be. Uh, I'm leaving tomorrow for the coast, so I'm going to go experience a little bit of the uh, the coast. And then uh, after next week's show, we'll have Dr. John Scala and Jamie Arnold on, and we're going to kind of preview the uh, upcoming hurricane season. And the week after that, we kind of continue with the hurricane mm. theme, and we have uh, Jim Eds on. As he will be kind of talking to us about uh, some of his hurricane chases. So yes, if you guys if you guys enjoyed the Gary England show a couple weeks back, you're going to enjoy Jim Ed's show also. Yeah, looking forward to him. Uh, he had, what was it Letterman? He was on Letterman or he was on what? He was I think he was on Letterman. Okay, he was Letterman. on Letterman. You can definitely YouTube that, and what you see there is what you're going to get with our show. So we're looking forward to that. And as always, uh, we're kind of running out of our schedule. Uh, we're always looking for new show topics, so if you have anything, please feel free to let us know. Uh, anything you want to know, uh, weather-wise or astronomy-wise, just uh, shoot that to us, and we will get uh, some guests on, and we'll definitely talk about it. So um, with that, I am going to uh, sign off, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Have a great week, and uh, stay safe. All right,